Here are the stories we're covering this week in the Category5.tv newsroom. The UK taxman has fallen foul of the GDPR, agreeing to wipe 5 million voice recordings used to make biometric IDs. Did your Firefox browser break over the weekend? You're not alone. In fact, virtually everyone who uses Mozilla's popular browser encountered this issue, and we'll tell you why. On Tuesday, Google began rolling out a new feature that allows you to configure how long it can save data from all of the Google services you use, like Maps, Search, and everything you do online. And researchers have taken steps towards an iconic Star Trek medical device. These stories are coming right up. Don't go anywhere. This is the Category5.tv newsroom, covering the week's top tech stories with a slight Linux bias. Jeff Weston, yeah, man. you're building a brand new beautiful website. What? Aren't you? No. Am I? Oh, you're a terrible actor. What? This is where acting comes into play. Oh, I didn't know we were acting. You're supposed to act. Okay, fair enough. All right. yeah, I'm building a really cool website. Are you building a really cool website? Just because Jeff is confused doesn't mean you have to be. Visit cat5.tv slash dreamhost to sign up for unlimited web hosting for your website with unlimited email accounts, MySQL databases, the latest version of PHP, WordPress, and more, and even a free domain name registration. It's less than $6 per month, so sign up today. cat5.tv slash dreamhost. Sasha Rickman, and here are the top stories we're following this week. The UK taxman has fallen foul of the GDPR, agreeing to wipe 5 million voice recordings used to make biometric IDs. Yes, that's right. Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs, aka the tax collector, has agreed to delete 5 million voice recordings that it used to create biometric IDs. The voice IDs were used to speed access to its phone lines, but were created before the implementation of the European General Data Protection Regulation and violated the tougher rules. HMRC will keep about 1.5 million voice IDs, which are in use, but delete around 5 million where explicit consent was not received and where those people had never used the system since creating the ID. It's actually some pretty cool tech. They had followed several banks and other organizations in using a My Voice is My Password system to identify account holders. It will continue to use the system, but in line with GDPR rules and its own published privacy policy. Chief Executive Sir Jonathan Thompson said in a letter that they will continue to use Voice ID because it is, quote, popular with our customers, is a more secure way of protecting customer data, and it enables us to get callers through to an advisor faster, end quote. I'm calling about my taxes. <laughs> <laughs> Just let me talk to you about my taxes. So what? Somebody can, uh, maybe like a Trump... Um, impersonator? impersonator could actually get to the bottom of some, uh, some stuff. stuff. Like, what yeah. happens if you, like, <laughs> there's, that's so many, I mean, granted, they're getting rid of so many voice data files, but what happens if you sound just like somebody else? Sure. Do, can you? I, like, I, I or know. is there, is it like fingerprints? Nobody is knows. there like actually a, like a subtle difference all the time? It must be there's an some, intonation difference. Some people right? that can rock some really good impressions. But yeah. what if your voice changes? What if, right? Like I was just saying to Robbie that... When I wake up in the morning, I've got this great, deep <laughs> radio I've voice. I've been washing my hands so much that my fingerprint reader doesn't work on my phone anymore. So what if you... What? Yeah, I've like washed my fingerprints to... They're too weak so now. So trained it dirty fingerprint it's like that no, time at the cottage raised fingerprint but i've washed them all off like i was fixing something at the cottage and i got crazy glue on my fingers and couldn't unlock my phone for oh, a that's week funny <laughs> right so okay so this can happen what if your voice changes right so like, like laryngitis when you're calling in and it's yeah like, oh, no. right. or there's got to be an alternate way right, to yeah. authenticate or a burn or something right like something sure. can happen yeah mm -hmm. Ugh, yeah there must be an alternate authentic there are absolutely I mean, the yeah. two factors about the fact that they have to delete because they didn't get the consent. Like, you have to want. Now, now, granted, all these people have not checked in with the service since. But, like, what kind of impact is that going to have in the future if those people do happen to call in? Well, they'll have to wait in line to talk to an advisor. There you go. That's yeah. all. Or enter, enter a new voice print ID. Right. Because it's been deleted. 
right. which now they will get explicit consent. Correct. Yeah. Right. Because you know, a- after GDPR came into play, now they know. Okay, we we have to, and that's why they can keep the last one point five million. Yeah. Which is because those ones it, comply. Is it really that bad to have somebody's voice on record? I guess maybe it is, but I wouldn't think I th- it would be of concern if it's if it's an AI imprint of your voice. Then could it not be used to then authenticate against other AIs? Oh. You could like write a whole speech in Sasha voice. Chew on so that. All my R's right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Did your Firefox browser break over the weekend? You're not alone. In fact, virtually everyone who uses Mozilla's popular browser encountered this issue, and we'll tell you why. On Friday, the expiration of a Mozilla certificate used to check the signatures of add-on codes in Firefox desktop and Android web browsers caused a nearly universal failure of Firefox plugins and extensions as browsers detected them as invalid and disabled them. Ouch. Yeah. The bug dubbed Armageddon 2.0 was addressed by a hot fix issue over the weekend and a new version of the browser has been pushed out. This isn't the first time this sort of thing has happened with Firefox. The original Armageddon happened almost exactly three years ago on May 2nd, 2016, when an expired certificate caused signature verification errors for add-ons. A a patch was pushed out to most Firefox desktop users on May 5th. However, the fix does not help Firefox, ESR, or Android users. An update for those browsers is still in the works. For some users, the patch required them to change browser privacy and security settings before it can kick in. Because Mozilla is deploying the patch using Firefox's Studies system to rapidly deploy the patch. Studies is a system used by Firefox to deploy pre-released features to users before they're added to a release update. Some organizations and users may disable Studies because they introduce code that hasn't been f- tested fully and might send usage data back to Mozilla. But because of the speed with which Mozilla needed to deploy the certificate fix, it was pushed out with studies rather than as part of a browser update, which means users will have to at least temporarily re- re-enable studies to regain functionality. From the point of view of enabling studies, it could take up to six hours for the patch to be applied. So six hours after enabling studies. If you even catch it now, and then there's those of us, like I'm pretty tech savvy. I installed Chrome when it happened because I just, what's yeah. going on? Last pass isn't working. I can't get onto any websites. Yeah. Forget this. I had installed no problem. Chrome, installed LastPass, and that's all I, that's what's Did, on my computer now. You know what's What do odd? you use? I have Chrome and Firefox. Yeah. And I happen to be on both this weekend and had zero issue. Lucky you. Huh. You were offline. <laughs> you no, didn't get I was, the... I was, on, I was building website all weekend. I've had certificates uh, expire, yeah. and I've had to retroactively fix that. Huh. But I'm generally a pretty small player in the grand scheme of the interwebs. Now, M- Mozilla, not so much a small player. Right. So like one of the top two browsers in the universe. Mm-hmm. Like aliens use this stuff, folks. <laughs> so this kind of thing shouldn't happen. Twice. Twice. Happened twice. It just shouldn't happen. Ever. And I think that's probably the discussion that they're having around the boardroom table today. Somebody's in super trouble. <laughs> it just shouldn't happen. And it really it makes me feel less confident in the company. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Um, I also just want to say this whole studies thing reminds me of like Windows updates that can break <laughs> systems, right? <laughs> I just no. The if whole it was thing, Windows updates, it would have broke the system when it updated. That's yeah. right. This is an update to fix the system, right? But people have turned off this studies thing, mm-hmm. right? Specifically because they don't want Mozilla to collect their right. data and yes. do, do all you, this weird. The, yeah. The question stuff. is, do you want to? allow us to install test patches right no, no i want no. i want the good stuff test the patches yeah and then release then them install them. them yeah yeah exactly on tuesday google began rolling out a new feature that allows you to configure how long it can save data from all of the google services you use like maps search and everything you do online 
Until now, you had to manually go in and delete this data or turn it off entirely. But delegate, deleting it means Google doesn't always have enough information about you to make recommendations on what it thinks you'll like or where you might want to go. Now, you can tell Google to automatically delete personal information after three months or 18 months. Google's activity page says this, quote, the activity you keep can improve your experience anywhere you use your Google account. What you search, read, and watch can work together to help you to get things done faster, discover new content, and pick up where you left off, end quote. Google said during its event Tuesday that it will expand these controls to make them easier to find right inside its app. But for now, the quickest and easiest way to manage your privacy is under data and personalization when you log into myaccount.google. You'll find the new feature under manage activity. Google said that it's also rolling out similar controls for how it tracks your location data. Some people may say, oh, but I don't want Google to track me. So, I... you know, why, why does it matter to me that Google needs to be able to make recommendations, right? Yeah, I, I personally, and I realize that I'm probably in the very strong minority on this one. Um, I love my my search history being sure. remembered, my preferences being remembered. Mm -hmm. I rate places I've been and hope that Google will tell me places like it. And I love my location services on because sometimes I forget what I did yesterday and then my phone reminds me. That aside, <laughs> being able to look back at your history, being able to look at, uh, that's fantastic, and mm -hmm. maybe that's something you might want to opt out of. But keeping in mind that part of what makes Google so great, so powerful, and dare I say so accurate, is that it is able to learn from what you're looking for. And, and so we, we think in terms of advertising, because that's the way the media slants it. Right. And, and we think, oh, but I don't want targeted advertising. I don't want those things. I don't want you to know more about me to be able to display ads. Well, yeah. when I search in Google, it also presents results systematically based upon what it thinks I'm probably looking for. Right. right. So Search Engine Optimization 101 says Java is the name of an island. So if I'm searching for vacation spots and I'm looking for um, a vacation home or, or a rental or something like that, mm -hmm. and I go into Google and I type in Java, now if it doesn't know anything about me, it's just going to give me a whole bunch of pages about coffee. Right. If it knows that I'm looking for a vacation hotspot, it may present me with this sweet little island. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. So this information is very, very helpful when it comes to the search engine standings and how things are presented to me within Google. Google for me is super smart and intuitive in that I'll search for a recipe one day mm -hmm. and three days later in my news feed a whole bunch of different recipes will come up. I've made delicious dinners just based on the fact that Google's <laughs> like Sash is kind of into cauliflower right now. There you Let's go. Send her some stuff. Yeah what's I in your fridge? <laughs> That's right. Here you go. Here's Flour. some recipes. It's delicious. Caulif I took cauliflower, yeah. sliced it sideways. Yeah, I saw that. And I marinated it and brushed it with some nice, like, I made my own marinade and everything. And I barbecued it. My n I also put a steak next to it. That's for me. That's for me. My new favorite is I tech, take not cauliflower. I take this is ridiculous. the florets and I, br like, I, I make like a flour water garlicky paste thing. Am I right? I brush the stuff on it, put it in the oven, then I bake it for about 20 minutes, and then I put hot sauce on it, bake it again for there another 20 go. minutes. It's kind of like cauliflower A little Tabasco. Super good. Mm -hmm. Anyway. Jeff wants to move on. <laughs> Researchers have taken steps towards an iconic Star Trek, Star Trek medical device. How have you been treating yourself lately? Any cuts or abrasions? Have you had to kiss any skin knees? gotten a scratch from a temperamental cat? If you've had to reach for a bandage since the year began, don't worry, you're not alone. In fact, in 2018, the U.S. spent close to $774 million on self-sticking bandages of various kinds. Wow. And we needed them. Open wounds must be covered up so that they can heal properly. You don't want anything infecting the dermis. That's your skin while it grows a new layer to replace what was lost in injury. And that takes time. 
Obviously a paper cut heals faster than a nasty slip of the knife while dicing veggies for dinner. And even that heals faster than a larger wound sustained in a high impact accident. The larger the wound, the longer it takes to heal. If your skin is too damaged to heal by itself or with the aid of stitches, um, doctors might try taking a graft of healthy skin from another part of your body to replace the injured spot, but it's a painful process leaving you with just that much more dermis to regrow. Taking healthy skin from somebody else isn't an option either. Your immune system, zealous defender that it is, might mistakenly treat the new graft as hostile and make you terribly sick as it tries to fight off the invader. Of course, in Star Trek's 24th century, any ship's sick bay, home medicine cabinet, or halfway decent field medical kit includes a trusty dermal regenerator. It's the ultimate point and click solution. Just aim it at the wound and turn it on, and its gentle beam of healing light magically closes the skin up. How, how does it do that? The name is a dead giveaway. A dermal regenerator seems to literally regenerate your dermis by prompt prompting new skin cells to grow in the beam's wake. It's the perfect solution. While you won't find the 24th century's answer to the Band-Aid in a drugstore near you anytime soon, we can at least see it in our long-term range sensors. Researchers at the Wake Forest Institute for Regenerative Medicine, led by assistant professor Sean Murphy, developed something that they call a mobile skin bioprinter in June 2018. The paper was just published in Nature's Journal Scientific Reports in February 2019. Let's say you've got a big bad scrape that needs healing and you call the Wake Forest team into action. First, they take a small sample of healthy skin from you and they put it into a jar where it can grow independent of your body. Once lab techs have a nice supply of healthy, happy skin cells, they mix them into a life-sustaining hydrogel and pour it into the bioprinter, which looks like a couple of microwaves combined with a 3D printing arm bolted to a rack on wheels. They roll it over to your bedside, where an attached device scans your scrape, getting a laser's eye view of all its contours and ridges. The machine proceeds to figure out exactly where and how to place layers of new cells so that they'll match the structure of the skin that was originally there. Once the scanning is done, the bioprinter's printing arm gets to work putting down the cells it was given layer by layer. Initial tests were highly encouraging. The bioprinter technique closes wounds faster, causes less puckering from, sc and from scarring, and generates new skin quicker. The next step for the Wake Forest team is to start clinical trials on humans. Wow. I don't want to be somebody who needs this, but right. I'm happy that it exists if I become somebody who needs it. Sounds like the future. It, it does. I mean, we've been printing body parts and organs for a little bit now like you know you've heard about uh you know um a heart i think yeah yeah yes. two years ago was 3d but that's like that's not bio like this that's is like, true this is bio like, well, on no, I, your I body that. so like, i mean this is totally a natural progression but what i what wasn't clear to me from the story is are we talking about like deep gouges that they're looking to fill in or just like, oh, I've, I've got like a boo-boo. A, like, I would say it, it probably does, like, epidermis, dermis, right? Like, probably not subcutaneous. Like, it's probably not regenerating fat, right? No, I would think so. So I mean, it's, it's just, just skin, like, like... Good, let the fat go. Like, yeah. <laughs> right? So I picture, like, a car when you get a scratch and you get the exact same color paint and you just kind of fill in, right? right. So if you have the exact same dermis yeah and it's a spray and they can just kind of spray it on and yeah and it it's is your, your skin. skin so they must use some sort of weird like stem cell situation to grow more skin maybe you Wh think. what i'm wondering though is could this take on a cosmetic approach like i'm thinking of people who have had really bad car accidents or whatever oh that, why not yeah know, maybe are missing part of their face or something and it's like i struggle with this because of the way i look could you take that and go you know what we're gonna regrow that part of the face that like i would right. think I, like it sounds to me like a replacement for grafts right so so far could a graft could go that way it could go that way well i just i think to myself like when i was working at a restaurant there was a guy who was working in the kitchen and somehow he burnt his leg like his shin area and oh, the no. skin would never close up over it and they were mm. even putting layers oh. of silver on it to try and 
to foster some sort of regeneration and healing. I'm this sure sounds he's like, fine now. like the early 30s. Like, let's just like rub some mercury like they on put, that. So evidently, <laughs> silver is a really good <laughs> healing thing, but they really? were putting like layers of this silver. I'm pretty sure that's a vampire bite right Anyhow, there. Anyhow, <laughs> right now, if that were to happen now and you were really close to the Wake Forest Institute, yes. A prime candidate because it's just skin like the skin on your shin is really thin <laughs> so right. wow. so you can just sure. print new skin i love it think about an abrasion yes. as a perfect example of a great starting point yeah so like ah oh yeah shh, right yeah like that seems like like a like practical a thing to, to expedite sort of regrowth of, of natural skin. Right. And because these are your skin cells being sprayed on. And the thing is, your skin is the first defense. Like, it's a protective layer. Mm -hmm. So the sooner you can get that covered up, the better your chances are of not developing other right. complications yep, medically. Yep. Something else getting in and causing an infection or right. anything else. Yeah. Way That's to cool. go Very for cool. Wake Forest Industries. You brought. Think of this moment 10 years from now when they absolutely revolutionize the world of medicine. Right. Sounds incredible. Um, let's get a real quick look at CoinGecko. Here's what the crypto market looked like as of 1800 hours Eastern time on Wednesday, March 8th, 2019. Bitcoin gained a lot. So if you invested mm -hmm. in Bitcoin this week, you're doing well. Um, gained $576.98 U.S. in the past week alone. It's almost 10%, was it not? It's up from 53.39 all the way to 59.16. Okay, so yeah. doing quite well. Litecoin um, is up a little bit at 74.31. Ethereum at 169.24, gaining about $11. Monero is at $66.48. Again, gaining. Now, now, the little guys have lost ever so slightly, and Stellite, as we used to know it, has renamed itself. So what? they found out Stellite is actually a trademarked name. So it is now called Torque. And when you hear Torque on the show, just oh. remember that we are now talking about what was formerly known as Stellite. And they are sitting at 1.18 ten thousandths of a cent. Turtle Coin is at 1.14. Remember, if you're going to trade or do anything in the crypto market, remember that it is always volatile. And because the cryptocurrency market never closes, it could change overnight. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not like the stock market that closes at you know 5 p.m. or whatever it is. Not it this. just keeps on going and things keep on changing. So do keep that in mind. Random side note. My neighbor's yes. dog is named Torque. Torque. Yes. I thought you were going to say crypto. That would no, have been awesome. would have been good too. Anyone, if you name your dog crypto, we will send you a gift. That's right. And probably a sticker or something. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> Big thanks to Roy W. Nash and our community of viewers for submitting stories to us this week. Thanks for watching the Category 5.TV newsroom. Don't forget to like and subscribe for all your tech news with a slight Linux bias. And for more free content, be sure to check out our website. From the Category 5.TV newsroom, I'm Sasha Rickman. And I'm Robbie Ferguson. And I'm Jeff Weston.